Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the latest installment of the Option Industry Council's webinar series. My name is Mark Benziquin, and I'm a staff member here at the OIC, and I'm happy to guide you through today's session. We're glad you could join us to learn more about options as a flexible and powerful trading tool. In our webinar today, Bull Spreads and Bear Spreads, What You Need to Know, we'll be focusing on what's known as vertical spreads, and we'll take a look at how they're constructed, what the best target price is for the underlying, and what risk factors you should consider. We'll also be discussing a handful of other types of bull and bear spreads as well. And as always, we'll cover the material and your questions in a quick 60-minute session. Our instructor today is a member of OIC's Investor Services team, Mr. Ed Modla. Ed started in the options industry in 1997, working with Blair Hull's trading group. And after a number of years in the pits in both Chicago and New York, Ed traded independently and later transitioned to helping investors with both futures and options on futures. He joined OIC in 2014 and brings a special understanding to our discussion of using options effectively while minimizing risk and maximizing returns. Additionally, our previous webinars can be viewed on the OIC YouTube channel. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Ed Modla will bring you our topic today, Bull Spreads and Bear Spreads, What You Need to Know. Ed? Thank you very much, Mark, for that introduction, and welcome, everybody, as we kick off the second half of the year. Uh, the first half was very successful. Uh, the June Summit event had massive turnout, and we had a lot of feedback from our attendees, so to those of you who attended and provided that feedback. Thank you very much. First, we're going to do our risk disclosure. Uh, options are not suitable for everyone. Uh, it is essential and imperative that an investor become very familiar with options before they trade them in a live account. If you do not have options trading approval in your account, you will need to get a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options and review that booklet. Uh, you can obtain a copy by contacting your brokerage firm. Also today, we're going to go through some examples with computations and numbers, but we will not include certain costs like commissions, fees, uh, margin requirements, and taxes. Those are important costs to consider in a live account, but to simplify things here today, we will not include those types of costs. The Options Industry Council, or the OIC, is the industry leader in equity options education. Our mission is to provide free and unbiased education to investors and financial advisors. We do that, of course, through webinar presentations. We also have live seminars around the country. Uh, our website, optionseducation.org, has an abundance of material. The bulk of our education is through that website. And we also print uh, publications for financial uh, institutions and publications around the world. All of the things that we have to offer are free of charge to the users because our efforts are funded by the options exchanges. And you see those listed here. Uh, the exchanges, along with the Options Clearing Corporation, fund the efforts of the Options Industry Council. They all have a vested interest in seeing that options are used effectively and wisely and that the industry grows. So they fund the efforts of the OIC. Speaking of that industry growth, I know there's a lot of you who are new attendees to our webinar today. This is a slide that visually represents the growth of the industry. You can see since the early 70s, uh, there's been constant growth, but an explosion about 15 years ago. There's certainly a number of reasons for that. Um, I like to point out certainly uh, the advent of electronic trading has increased the speed at which executions can be made and the access that investors have to options, uh, but also uh, there's much more widespread acceptance of options within the investment community. Uh, back years ago, uh, there was a myth that options were too risky for an investor's portfolio, uh, but through more awareness and education, that myth no longer exists, and advisors and investors are uh, taking advantage of options to reduce risk and enhance returns in their portfolio. Uh, currently, we're trading about 16 million, just over 16 million contracts every day. Here's our outline for today. We will uh, review what spreads means, uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, and then we'll talk about the mitigating effect uh, that spreads have on a position, and we'll focus on delta for that, and then we'll move into bull spreads. As Mark said, we'll focus on verticals today, the bull call and bull put verticals. I'll touch on a few more bull spreads and then follow the same format from the bearish side, uh, focusing on the verticals and getting into great detail on the risk-reward of those talk about a few more bear spreads, and then we'll wrap it up with some key concepts uh, to keep in mind, not just for spreads, but for your 
an options trading portfolio in general. Now let's define spread to make sure we're on the same page here. I've talked to investors who have thought that a spread required more than one option in a, uh, in a position. And if you learned it that way, uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But most of the investment community, including myself, I had learned that spread uh, refers to any strategy that has more than one part or more than one component. And that could be uh, a multitude of options or it could be a stock position combined with an option position. And spread generally uh, does not have a limitation on what it could include. You can customize and create your own spread that has many uh, parts to it. Uh, each component and each part is known as a leg, and that's the industry term that you'll see often. We'll reference it throughout the presentation today. Uh, many of you are likely familiar with the covered call strategy uh, that has a long stock position and a short call position, or short call uh, combined with it. Uh, each of those is a leg. So the covered call has two legs. Uh, if you executed that spread together, bought the stock and sold the call at the same time, what's traditionally known as your buy right, uh, you can establish the spread that way, or you can buy the stock first and subsequently uh, sell a call option later on. That's your more traditional covered call. Uh, if, you did, if you enter the position uh, separately like that, then you would be executing a legging into the spread or legging into the position, uh, taking each part and executing them uh, individually. Now, spreads are important uh, because they certainly can affect your risk reward and you can manage them uh, more appropriately and to your liking, but they also have a, a mitigating effect. And I'll, I'll use that word as well throughout the presentation, uh, starting with mitigating risk. Uh, for example, if you're an option buyer and you're expecting a move in the underlying in one direction or the other, uh, you may look to sell another option to reduce your cost and reduce your overall risk, not changing the fact that you can profit from the move in the underlying that you're expecting, uh, but mitigate your risk to some extent. Uh, if you're a, an option writer and you're selling options, of course, there's a lot of risk attached to selling options. So you might look to buy an option uh, that mitigates that risk. And again, uh, puts together a position consistent with your market outlook, but with less risk. So you're mitigating risk in that sense. And those examples are going to foreshadow what we're going to come up with here pretty soon with the verticals. Uh, also, there's mitigation with the Greeks. Um, if you have exposure to theta or vega and you want to neutralize that to a certain extent, you can use spreads to do that. Um, uh, some spreads can also take advantage of the Greeks. So if you have an opinion on where volatility is headed or you want to be uh, short theta, you can look for spreads uh, that can take advantage of those. So mitigating risks, mitigating and neutralizing your Greeks, we're going to look at this a little deeper, uh, specifically with delta. Now we know delta is the expected change in an options price for a one-point move in the underlying stock price. So for example, if we own a call option that is deep in the money, let's say it's got 100 delta, uh, we are long 100 deltas in our account. We own 100 deltas. If the stock moved up by a dollar, uh, our option would likely move up by uh, close to a dollar. So if we're long an at-the-money call option with a delta of 50 and the stock moved up by a dollar, we would expect the value of our option to move up by 50 cents. Uh, spreads similarly have one singular delta attached to them, and you can arrive at that singular number simply by combining all of the deltas of the legs within the spread. So if we owned both of those options, a deep in the money with 100 delta and at the money with a 50 delta, uh, the combined deltas would be 150. Uh, if the stock moved a point higher, we can expect that our entire account would increase by $1.50. That might not be common for you to be long both of those. You might be long one and short one. So let's look at that. If you were long a deep in the money option with a 100 delta and short an at the money option with a 50 delta, then you'd have long 100 deltas combined with short 50 deltas. That nets out to long 50. And if the stock moved higher by a dollar, you would expect your spread or your position to increase by 50 cents. Look at that again a little bit deeper. And we're going to start by looking at a single option. Stock's trading at $50, and we are uh, noticing the at-the-money call option, which has a value in the market for of $3. That's the option premium. 
uh, this would be a 50 delta call, and if the stock moved up by a dollar, we would expect the call option to increase by 50 cents. Now, instead of having a 50 call, what if we were long a 45 call and simultaneously short a 55 call and the net deltas between the two were 50? We'd see the same thing. If the stock went up a dollar uh, and the value of that spread was three, then uh, the value of our spread would increase roughly to $3.50. We could take that a step further. If the stock went up another dollar, uh, you might see this individual call option go up by 60 cents. That's consistent with a 60 delta. Uh, if our spread had a 60 delta and started out with a, uh, a premium value of 350, we'd expect the spread to increase to 410. So you can combine these deltas uh, in your position to come up with one singular number. Now keep in mind the limitation of delta is that it assumes all other factors are fixed, including delta itself. That's likely not going to be the case in the live market. These Greeks, including delta and theta and volatility, are fluid and changing all the time. Now when you uh, do this combination of deltas, it's important to make sure you have the positives and the negatives straightened out. Of course, we know in-the-money options have larger deltas and out-of-the-money options have your smaller deltas. Uh, but let's uh, back up to option basics for a second, options 101. And uh, think about the fact that there's four possible sides to an options trade. You could be long a call or short a call, or you could be long a put or short a put. And what we want to do is isolate each of those four and determine whether or not they have a positive or negative delta. And the way to think about that is if the isolated trade would profit if the stock moved higher, then there's a positive delta attached with that trade. If it would profit from the stock moving lower, then there's a negative delta attached to that trade. So if we're long a call option, that would profit from the stock moving higher. That's a positive delta trade. If we're short a put option, that's also profitable with the stock moving higher. So that's also a long delta or positive delta trade. Selling a call option, profits with the stock moving lower. That's a negative delta trade. And of course, buying a put option profits with the stock moving lower. So if you buy a put option, you are buying negative deltas. And we'll keep that in mind and elaborate as we move forward. But now it's time to get into our spreads. Our bull side comes first, and we will start with the bull call spread. This is a vertical. The term vertical, by the way, means a couple things. You see both of them on your screen here. First of all, it means we're talking about the same stock. Uh, but also staying in the same expiration month. And we're trading one option versus another, moving up and down the ladder of strike prices within the same expiration month. And that's where the word vertical comes from, moving up and down the strikes. The bull call spread consists of buying one call, call option and selling another one. Now we're bullish, so we want to profit with the stock moving higher. That means we want net long deltas in our account. If we're buying one and selling another one, uh, we have to buy the call option which has stronger deltas or a higher delta. And for calls, that would be the lower strikes. So for the bull call spread, it entails buying a call option with a lower strike and selling another call option with a higher strike. Uh, premium amounts for call options are also greater at the lower strike. So this is a debit spread. We'd be paying for this spread. If you were entering this into your platform, uh, what you would do is enter a buy to open for a call option at a lower strike, sell to open a call option at a higher strike. You could enter this at a market order if you wanted to as a market order, uh, or you can specify your price with a limit order. In this case, you would be entering a limit debit order, debit referencing the fact that you are paying for this spread. So it would be a limit debit, and then you can identify what price you're comfortable paying for this spread. Now let's look at an example Let's say our stock XYZ is trading at 63, and we think, based on our market analysis, the stock's going up by about 10%, uh, and it'll happen by expiration. So it's going up to roughly $70 a share. We could buy the 60 call outright. That would be bullish. We know that. But the 60 call costs $5.50. We don't want to spend that much money. And if we're wrong, we stand to possibly lose all that. So we reach up to the 70 strike price, and we sell that call. We sell it for $2. This reduces our total cost. Our net debit is $350. That's the most we can lose. Now, of course, there are limitations 
that we undertake by selling that call. Think about what we have here. We have the right to buy shares at 60, but the obligation to sell those shares at 70. So we now have limitations on what we can make to the upside, but benefits as well. Uh, our forecast, again, was that the stock was going to go up near 70 and not through it. So the limitation of selling shares at 70 is something that we are comfortable with. We want to eventually take that uh, premise and put it together with an example on a P&L graph. The best way to visualize and interpret the risk profile of a spread is to create a profit and loss graph. We do so by starting with this chart. And what we'll do is we'll take stock prices at expiration and then calculate what the combined profit or loss is and then use the stock price versus the profit loss and plot those on a graph. So let's say the stock finishes at 63.50 at expiration. The 60 call is now $3.50 in the money. It has value of 350. We paid 550 for it, so we lost $2 on that leg of the spread. The 70 call option expires out of the money and worthless. We received $2 when we sold it, so we profited $2 on that leg for a net result of zero. This is our break-even point. Now we want to also look at going up and down the strike prices. If we go higher, say to a strike price of 70 or above, this spread has reached its full value. The full value of this spread is $10, and with both options in the money, it has reached full value. We paid $3.50 for a spread that has reached full value of 10, that would represent a $6.50 profit. On the downside, if the stock moves lower down to 60 or below, both options would expire out of the money and worthless. The spread would have no value whatsoever. So our 350 cost, our 350 debit we paid when we entered the spread would be our loss. Going up from 75 or down from 55 is not going to change those numbers. They're constant. And the P&L graph that we can put up as a result of having constructed that chart shows us that. This visually represents what the risk profile looks like. You can compare this to your market analysis and determine, is this the trade I want? Notice where your break-even point is, how you make money, and how you lose money, and where your risks are. You can see on the, on the upside, we have limitations. Above 70, we cannot continue to make money. On the downside, we're also protected. There's a maximum loss and a maximum gain, and that's the beauty of verticals. During the lifespan of the options, you know exactly how much you can make and how much you can lose. You can also calculate your break-even points, and if all of those parameters are consistent with your market outlook, uh, then you might consider executing the trade. Next up is the bull put spread, also a vertical. So we're staying with the same stock, same expiration month. We're going to buy a put option and sell another put option with a different strike price. Now we're bullish. We're still on the bullish side here. So we want net long deltas in our account. Remember what we said earlier, selling a put option is a positive delta trade while buying it, buying a put is a negative delta trade. So we need to sell the put option that has a stronger delta. And for puts, those are for higher strike prices. So in this case, we're selling a put option with a higher strike and buying a put option that has a lower strike. Uh, the higher strike put will also have higher premium. So this will be a credit spread. We're receiving option premium to execute this trade. Order entry on this one, sell to open, a put with a high strike, a buy to open, a put with a lower strike price, and then for the price, we could enter market. That's always a choice of yours if you're comfortable with that, or if we want to specify our price, we will use a limit order, and in this case, it is specifically a limit credit, and we will then enter the price at which we want to receive for selling the spread. Here's our example. Stock's at 39, and we are neutral to bullish. We think the stock's going a little bit higher. We could sell the 40 put outright for 250, but we know that selling a naked option has a lot of risk attached to it. We're not comfortable with that level of risk, so we go to the 35 put and we pay a dollar for it. This reduces our net credit and our profit potential, uh, but we're comfortable with that because the 35 put provides us with protection, and we will see that protection visually when we construct our P&L graph. Uh, first of all, we'll start with the stock finishing at 38.50. Notice the 40 put in this case would be a dollar 50 in the money, or have a dollar 50 in value. Uh, we sold it for 250 originally, so that's a dollar profit. 
the 35 put expires out of the money and worthless. We paid a dollar for it, so we lose a dollar on that leg for a combined profit loss of zero. This is our break-even point. Moving up and down, uh, if the stock moves to 40 or above, both options are out of the money. Both of them are worthless. We received $1.50 originally for a spread that ends up having no value whatsoever, so our profit is $1.50 moving higher. The stock runs lower to 35 or below. This put spread has reached its full value of $5. We received $1.50 originally for a spread that ends up being worth $5. That's a loss for us of the difference or a loss of $3.50. Here's our P&L graph with a break-even point and where we can make money and how we lose money. Uh, notice compared to selling the 40 put, uh, our break-even point is a little bit higher before we start to lose money. That's working against us here, the spread versus the outright put. The maximum profit is also less. We received $150 instead of just selling the 40 put for $250. So we're giving up a little on break-even. We're giving up a little on max profit. But to the downside, if you just sold the 40 put, you'd have all that exposure down to the stock uh, trading lower and lower. But with the bull put spread, our 35 put starts to kick in. It'll neutralize our loss to the downside and you have a nicely constructed conservative or more conservative trade with the spread than the outright option. Now, something to point out before we move on, if you noticed in the first pages of each of these vertical put spreads, if you look at the, uh, the simplified P&L graph of the bull put spread and see how that's shaped with uh, risk and reward on both ends, and you compare that to the bull call spread. I'm going to switch slides here and go to the bull call spread. The graph looks very similar. It looks like the same shape, and in fact, it is. Uh, traditionally, uh, bull call spreads are used if your strike prices include at-the-money and out-of-the-money call options. Uh, bull put spreads, I'll flip back over to that slide. You can see same graph. Uh, traditionally used when you're using at the money or out of the money put strikes. But if you were to compare these two spreads to each other uh, using the same exact strikes, you'd likely find that the risk profile, the max gain, the max loss are almost, if not exactly, identical. And that's an interesting feature of vertical spreads that uh, the bull call and bull put are virtually the same trade. Uh, if anyone ever tells you that they're interested in buying an in-the-money call spread, uh, you can reply and say, why wouldn't you sell the out-of-the-money put spread at the same strikes? Because it's the same exact trade. Uh, and let them think about that for a while. So it's an interesting observation. It's also true on the bear side with the bear call and bear put. We'll get there uh, very shortly. Right now, we want to go back to a few more bull, put, uh, bull spreads and speak about the protective put and the collar. Now, the protective put on the left is a more aggressive trade. Uh, there's two legs to the protective put. One is being long shares of stock, and the other is being long a put option. This is your classic example of using options as insurance on, an, a, port on a portfolio or on an investment. Uh, you can see that your break-even point is higher. The dashed line on the screen represents just buying shares of stock. Uh, the protective put on the solid line has a higher break-even point because the stock needs to move higher for you to pay for the insurance of the put option. So your break-even point is higher. Your potential gain is a little bit less than you would if you just bought shares, but it's not capped to the upside. can keep making money as the stock moves higher. Uh, but the put option really shows its benefit to the downside, whereas just owning shares would continue to lose money. Uh, the protective put has protection on your strike price, which gives you the right to sell those shares and exit the position. Flipping over to the collar, this is uh, similar in construction, but with one difference that really changes the risk profile. Uh, the collar has three legs. One of them is long stock, another is long put, just like the protective put, but then we add selling a call option to it. Uh, we do that because we want the protection to the downside, but we don't want to pay for it. We don't want to adjust our break-even point that much higher. So we sell a call option to bring in premium that may pay for the entire cost of the put. Uh, the graph up here represents a situation where you actually sell a call option that has more premium 
than you paid to buy your protection. And I identify it that way because you notice where the break-even point is. If you were able to receive premium uh, within the collar, well, then your break-even point is actually better than it would have been if you just bought shares of stock. Now, the collar certainly is a trade consistent with a very moderate uh, upside uh, market bias. So if you uh, were slightly bullish in the stock uh, and wanted protection, then the collar might be a choice for you. You're willing to give up the shares at the call strike price. Uh, if you get called away, you want to capitalize on that short move from where the stock is today up to the strike price, knowing you can't continue to capitalize as the stock moves higher. That's in contrast to the protective put, which costs more, has a higher break-even point, uh, but has the benefit of increased profits should you get a large move higher. So there's a handful of bull spreads for you. Now we'll get into bear spreads starting the same way uh, with the verticals. The bear call spread, uh, same stock, same expiration month, buying one call option, selling another up and down the ladder of strike prices. Uh, since we're bearish, we want to be net short deltas. We want negative deltas in our account. Uh, so deltas are higher for lower call strike prices, which means we want to sell the lower strike price call and buy a higher strike price call. Uh, in this case, if you were entering the order into, into your system, it would be sell to open a lower strike call, buy to open the higher strike price, and uh, for your execution price, of course, market order is always available to you, but if you wanted to put in a limit order, in this case, since you're selling the option with a lower strike that has higher premium, you're receiving a credit. So you would enter a limit credit order and specify what price you wanted to enter for your spread execution. Our example here uh, starts out with the stock at 63, and this time we're bearish. We think the stock's going lower. Uh, we could sell a 60 strike price call for 550, but we know that the risk is very high to do something like that. So we reach up to the 70 strike price, and we pay $2 for the 70 strike price call, and now we have a bear call spread. We receive less credit. Instead of 550, we get 350. So we've changed our risk profile, but we've done so because we now protected the position. We're going to draw our chart here and do some calculations. If the stock was at 6350 at expiration, these are the same strikes we used earlier, so we would have our break-even point there at 6350. Now moving up and down the ladder, uh, for the bear call spread, if we moved higher, of course, uh, the uh, call spread has reached its full value of $10. Uh, we received $350 for it originally. It expires worth its full value of $10, which is $6.50 more than we received. That's a loss of $650. If the stock moves lower, down to $60 or below, then both options expire completely out of the money. Uh, the $350 credit we received would be marked against uh, a value of zero for the uh, spread at expiration. So that would be a profit of 350 as the stock continues to move lower. We take those numbers and construct our P&L graph here. We can see where our break even is, see where we make money, where we lose money, and where the protections are. And again, you compare this to your market forecast and the, the analysis that you've done on the stock and on the underlying. And if this looks consistent with your market forecast, uh, then you consider putting the trade on here. Now, again, uh, you can see the differences versus just selling the 60 strike price call. Our maximum profit is not 550, it's 350. Our break even point is lower instead of higher. Uh, but what we achieve by the spread versus the outright sale of the call is the protection to the, down, uh, to the upside. If the stock rallies significantly, the 70 strike call kicks in and protects our losses. Now we'll look at the bear put spread, our last vertical. Uh, looking at the same stock, same expiration month, moving up and down the ladder of strike prices, we're going to buy one put and sell another. Uh, in this case here, since we're bearish, we want to purchase negative deltas. We know that buying a put option has negative deltas and selling a put has positive deltas. So we want to make sure we're buying the put option that has stronger delta. Uh, in the case of puts, those are for your higher strike prices. Uh, so we're buying a put option with a higher strike and selling a put option with a lower strike. 
Uh, the higher strike, of course, also has more premium to it, so we'll be paying for this spread. It's a debit spread. Your order entry would look like this. You'd have, you'd have a, a buy to open, uh, a put option with a higher strike, sell to open, a put option with a lower strike. Uh, you can enter that into the market order if you wish, or specify a limit, debit, and then identify the price that you're willing to pay. Our example on this uh, spread here, XYZ stocks trading at 39. Forecast is that the stock may drop by 10% by expiration, or roughly $4, down to about the 35 strike price. Uh, we buy a 40 put option for $2.50 and simultaneously sell a 35 strike put for a dollar. We're thinking ahead here. If we just bought the 40 put option, we would have to recover $2.50. By doing the spread, we only pay $1.50. So our risk is less and our break-even point is going to be better. And again, if you're following along, you'll also see when we get to it in a few slides uh, that uh, we've, we've got protection, but it comes with some level of cost to it. So it's not all benefit. Uh, there is also something you give up. There's generally costs and benefits with any options trade that you do that you can analyze. So here, with the stock finishing at 38.50, the 40 put option is a dollar 50 in the money. It's worth a dollar 50. We paid 250 for it, so that's a loss of a dollar. The 35 put expires worthless and out of the money. We sold it for a dollar, so there's a dollar profit and our break-even point. Moving up and down the strike prices, if the stock moves to 40 or above, uh, this spread expires worthless. Both options are out of the money. They both have no value whatsoever. Uh, so we paid $1.50 for something that ends up having no value. We lose $1.50 with the stock moving up to 40 and above. To the downside, with the stock at 35 or below, the put spread has reached its full value of $5. We paid $1.50 for a spread that expires worth $5. That's a profit of $3.50. And here is our P&L graph. Uh, what we notice is better break-even points. Uh, and you have protection on both sides going up and down. So there's your four vertical spreads um, along with some extra bull spreads, and we'll talk uh, about a few more bear spreads here as well that can be slightly more complex. First of all, the bear uh, put back spread. Now this starts out looking like uh, the credit bull put spread. Now let's refresh our memory on what that is. The credit bull put spread was selling a put option with a higher strike price and buying a put option with a lower strike price. Well, to turn that into a bearish spread and to turn it into specifically the put back spread, we will buy more puts than we sell. Uh, you can buy as many as you want. You can buy two or three or four traditionally. Uh, to keep things simple, it's a, a one to two ratio. Uh, that we like to look at. So selling one put option at a higher strike and buying two options at a lower strike price puts you in a position to profit if the stock moves lower sharply because you have extra puts and they start to kick in as the stock moves lower in a uh, more magnified way. Now one of the reasons why you do a put back spread is because you can control what your loss is if you're completely wrong and the stock moves higher instead of lower. Uh, it is possible since you're selling an option that has more premium than the ones that you're buying individually, uh, that you could construct the put back spread as a credit or possibly for even money or maybe for a slight debit. And this allows you to tailor what you would lose, if anything, if the stock moved higher. So as we look at the P&L graph, uh, this spread would be consistent with a bearish outlook if you thought that a move lower was going to be magnified. In other words, if the stock moves lower, it's going to move lower in a big way. So I'm going to have extra puts to the downside, and that will pay off for me uh, as the stock goes below the, puts, the, the strike price of the puts that I own. But if I'm wrong, there's three possibilities, and you see those possibilities here. If I've constructed this spread to be a net credit, uh, then if the stock moves higher, I actually can profit a little bit. So if we're completely wrong, we may end up with a little profit. Now, of course, we give up something to have these benefits, to have the downside uh, aggressive uh, profit potential, to control our upside and really mitigate the risk uh, of our upside loss. 
uh, we're giving up the fact that if we are slightly correct on the market outlook and the stock moves down but not too far, we lose money. Uh, we're selling a strike price that is higher, so as the option moves below that strike, if it really doesn't get down to your long strike and beyond, that is all an area on this P&L graph uh, that would be a loss for the position. So again, put back spread uh, consistent with uh, an aggressive bearish outlook. If you think the stock is going to move lower, and if it does move lower, it's going to move lower in a big way, you can profit on the put back spread and you can control your loss if the stock moves completely in the other direction. Now let's look at the long put calendar. Uh, this is a uh, spread with two legs to it. We are buying a far-term put option and selling a near-term put option. We do this on a one-to-one -one ratio. This isn't ratioed like the back spread. Uh, we're staying at the same strike price and buying a longer-term option, which, of course, is going to have more premium. So we're paying for this spread, and it will be a debit spread. Now, there's a couple of different motivations you might have uh, for this spread, and that's why we don't have a P&L graph for this one, because there's a few different angles you can take. But you could be near-term bearish in the stock. Uh, if you bought a long put calendar spread using out-of-the-money strike prices, and the stock dropped to your strike in the near term, now all of a sudden your calendar spread is at the money and it might have more value than it did when you bought it. That would put you in a position to consider selling the spread back to the options market, closing out for a profit and being done with it. Uh, but there's another possible motivation you might have here and that's if you're long-term bearish. You want to buy a put, you think the stock is moving lower long-term, uh, but you want to uh, mitigate the risk of all of that cost of buying a long-term put option, and you don't think the stock is moving lower in the very near term. So you decide to sell a near-term option, which you are hoping expires worthless. If it does, the premium you received there stays in your account, and what you're left with is a long-term put option, which can profit from a move lower in the stock, and you own it at a somewhat reduced cost because you sold a short-term put option in the meantime, which expired out of the money and worthless. So it's near-term neutral, specifically near-term with the stock not going down to your short-term strike price, and then long-term bearish. If that strike, uh, if that near-term strike expired worthless, you can then decide how to manage it from there. Maybe you continue to sell near-term put options, or maybe you don't. Maybe you just hold the long-term put and keep the trade uh, strictly bearish that way. A few other titles for the long put calendar, time spread, because you're going out in time and choosing different expiration dates. Also want to point out horizontal spread. In contrast to what we focused on today, which was verticals moving up and down strike prices in the same expiration month, horizontal uh, is different. Same stock, but we're, we're staying in, also in the same strike price and moving out in time in a horizontal fashion. So that's horizontal versus uh, the verticals that we've talked about earlier. Now, I've mentioned order entry and how to execute spreads a few times during the presentation today, and, and we'll talk about that a little deeper here. There's a few ways to enter into spreads. Uh, first of all, you can enter all of the legs into your platform at once and identify a singular price at which you would like to uh, execute the entire package. Uh, if that uh, is executed in the marketplace, then all of those legs are filled simultaneously, and your account will get all of those positions at once. Um, when you're looking at your account, of course, each of those legs will have an individual price attached to it, but what's more important than those individual prices is the execution price of the package in its entirety. Uh, so one way to enter a spread is to enter all of the legs in at once on one screen and identify a net price, credit, or debit uh, that you want to enter to execute the spread, and if executed, all of those positions pop in at once. The other possibility would be to leg into the spread, and this is executing one leg at a time. You can do this when you're entering a spread or when you're closing a spread. Uh, one certain risk involved here is that if you leg in, uh, you, you have a, a time frame after your first leg is executed, 
you have some time in between when the, uh, when the second leg might be executed. So if there's a stock move that you're not expecting, uh, you could run into a position where you're unable to execute the full spread or because of that stock move, uh, you have to execute at a much worse price than you had intended and that's certainly a risk. Um, also, another risk is the possibility that legging could leave you with a short option which has a, a tremendous amount of exposure and in fact may be a position you're not even approved to have. So a lot of investors will consider legging into a spread by executing the long side first and then subsequently executing the short side just to avoid having that short option risk. Um, when you're exiting the spread, this comes up often because uh, if you sell out the long side of a spread, think about a vertical, think about a bull call spread, if you sell out the option you own, you'd be left with a short, exposed, naked option. And your account may not have approval for that. Even if it does, you may not want that. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. It may require you to buy the short option back first and then subsequently sell the option that you own. You may have to pay a few pennies uh, to close out that short option. If you're not legging out and you want to execute the whole thing at once, you may have to buy to close that short option, sell to close the long option, and when you put in your limit credit price, account for the fact that you're going to have to pay a few pennies to get that short option back. So uh, be careful at expiration how you manage the position. Make sure you don't have a, an exposed short position at any point in time if you're legging into or out of a spread. Now we'll quickly look at uh, an option quote and determine uh, how to read individual option quotes and turn them into a uh, spread quote. Uh, so here we're looking at a bull call spread, the XYZ May 60-65 call spread. And first, we're going to look at what it might cost us to buy this spread. Uh, if we're buying the call spread, we're buying the 60s and we're selling the 65s. Uh, the ask price is the, uh, the price we would need to reference if we're going to buy the 60 call. That's $4.10. If we sell the 65 call, we could sell it to the bid or the, or the price that the market is willing to pay. That is $1. So if you net those two out, the market is showing us that they are willing to sell us this spread for $3.10. If we entered this order into our system, and uh, placed a debit for 310 and our order was accepted by the exchange with these quotes being represented, we should get filled. Now, we use the word should uh, because it depends on size. Uh, there might be only one contract being offered at $4.10 while you're trying to execute uh, five or 10 of your spread. So it's not guaranteed that you'd be filled on your whole order, but uh, uh, by and large, should be filled on at least something if your order is accepted with those prices on the screen. Now let's look at the other side. If we were looking at selling this spread, we'd be selling the 60 call and buying the 65s. Uh, selling the 60 call would have to be done at $4. Buying the 65s would have to be done at $1.10. And net those two prices out, that's $2.90. That's the price that the market is willing to pay from us if we wanted to sell it. So the market for this call spread is $2.90 bid, $3.10 offer. If we want to buy it, we have to pay the ask. That's $3.10. If we want to sell it, we have to sell it to the bid. That's $2.90. Now, of course, we can work a price that we feel more comfortable with. If we wanted to be aggressive here and we were buying the spread, we can enter it in for a debit of 310. Uh, we could even go through that offer if we wanted to be ultra aggressive and virtually uh, give ourselves uh, every possibility of getting filled. We can go to 315, 320, put in a bid and hope we get everything at 310, but give ourselves a very good chance of getting the entire order filled by going up in price. Uh, on the other end, we could get a little bit more uh, picky with our price and try to pay 305 and see if anyone sells it to us or pay $3. Or if we thought the stock was going to drop down, maybe we work a price with the bid at 290 or even below that. 
Um, but but uh, what's important here to understand is that knowing what the market bid ask is gives us a reference point that we then can use to determine where do I want to be. If I'm buying this spread or selling this spread, what price do I need to do it at? Is that price something I'm comfortable with? And if not, where do I want to work my spread? Now, if we're willing to pay a lot more than 310, then maybe we jump on it right away. But if we're not, uh, we can work better prices and see if we can squeeze out a little bit better risk reward uh, for our position. Uh, now lastly, what we're going to do is go over a few slides here that, that aren't necessarily going to speak to spreads. Uh, they're really good ideas in general uh, for options trading uh, overall. Uh, first of all, know the risk reward of the trade that you're getting into. Uh, be conscious of what your market outlook and market bias is and make sure that the trade that you have is consistent with that. And that's uh, something to keep in mind with all options trading. The market outlook comes first. And if your market analysis is sound and you choose the right options trade, manage it properly, and your market outlook turns out to be correct, then you have a good chance of being successful trading options. Also, consider what, what you would do under different circumstances. Uh, this might be if the stock moves, how do I handle my position? What am I going to do if I have a profit or a loss? Or at expiration, with the stock at different prices, what do I have to do to make sure I manage myself out of this position appropriately and I have the position that I want to have coming to uh, Monday after expiration? This is a good place to talk about uh, the risk involved with verticals if the stock is in between the strike prices, for example. Let's say we have a bull call spread um, and the stock expires in between the strike prices. We're long a call at a lower strike, we're short a call at a higher strike, and the stock is in between. If we do absolutely nothing with our spread, uh, we'll likely be exercising those, uh, those, those long call options and end up purchasing shares of stock. The other option, which was covering our risk, um, within the duration of the option spread has expired worthless. So we would end up with long shares in our account. We may not want that, and that would be a risk. It certainly could be a greater risk if you're short an option and end up and could end up with a short shares position that you don't want to have. So keep that in mind and become familiar uh, with what you have to do to manage the position appropriately. It's not difficult to do, but if you understand it and can manage things appropriately, it can certainly help your chances for uh, success trading options. Also, when you trade spreads, you have to make sure you're approved for spreads. Uh, we have our virtual trading system on the OIC's website where, of course, you can go in and set your own trading level approval, give yourself the highest level you can possibly give yourself, but it doesn't work like that in the real world. Brokerage firms set trading levels. So be familiar to know with what approval you have and what you need to have in order to increase your trading level. Uh, some other key concepts to keep in mind, of course, we talked about knowing what your forecast is and knowing what your market analysis is and keeping your positions consistent with that. Uh, but also, options don't work all the time. It's key to choose the right strategy under the right circumstances and manage that trade appropriately. And lastly, what we'll get to here is, is comfort level. Uh, know what your brokerage firm's rules are and what their requirements are. If you do have an in-the-money option as you get to expiration, how is your brokerage firm going to handle that? Do they exercise your option if they don't hear from you? Uh, do they close out your option position if they don't hear from you? What does your brokerage firm do at expiration? Uh, and of course, uh, review statements carefully. I alluded to earlier when you're trading spreads, if you execute them all simultaneously, individual prices will be assigned to each leg of the spread. Uh, those are not so important. The important part is the overall price that you received or that you paid when you executed the spread. So net those premium amounts out and make sure they're correct. Validate that your confirmation, that your, that your statements are correct. Review your monthly statements and be very familiar with what your brokerage firm does under certain circumstances, including when an option is in the money. So uh, that concludes the presentation today. I encourage everyone to go to our website, optionseducation.org specifically, 
Uh, we have a, a section on the website that's called Strategies and Advanced Concepts. Uh, if you went to the Strategies section, you can filter by market outlook, whether you're bullish, bearish, or neutral, and review a number of different spreads. It's not an all-inclusive list, but it's a nice, healthy list. And uh, when selecting one of those spreads, you get a full page review. P&L graph, market outlook, calculations on profit, loss, break even, exposures, uh, risks. So uh, again, that's under the strategies and advanced concepts section, the strategies page where you can do that. Also, uh, as Mark uh, is going to point out here in a minute, uh, this presentation is archived, but also the YouTube channel, the OIC YouTube channel has an abundance of webinars that we've done in the past and a very long list of uh, previous presentations that we've given. So I'd encourage you to check that out as well. And with that, Mark, I will turn it back to you. Well, thank you, Ed. That was really some uh, fantastic information. Uh, I know that uh, with the the uh, questions that have been uh, and comments that have been coming over, people really uh, enjoyed the information that you gave us, and, and I think that everybody learned a, a great deal. Uh, like I said, we do have a few minutes left, so let's get to some of the questions that we have. Now, Ed, you mentioned that bull call spreads and bull put spreads are almost identical. Why would an investor choose to buy a spread when they can sell a spread and collect money? How should we choose between the two? Well, if you're, if you're analyzing those two spreads, and of course I mentioned that on the bear side, it's also a, a similar relationship between the bear call and bear put spread. Um, one factor to consider is exec execution price. If you're using uh, strike prices that are out of the money, you may get better execution prices using calls than you could, than you could for puts uh, because there are less premium amounts, smaller deltas, the markets may be, uh, may be tighter, and you might get better execution prices. And deciphering between whether you want to do a bull call and a bull put may come down to simply what execution price is available to you in the marketplace. Uh, if you're looking at the same strikes, of course, uh, the same methodology could apply, looking at uh, the execution prices available, but likely those will be very close to each other and you'd have a much uh, more difficult decision to make. Another factor uh, is commissions. Uh, think about the difference in commissions between the bull call and bull put. If you are correct on your forecast for the bull call spread, your options expire in the money. Now you can certainly sell to close that position, or if it ran through expiration, you'd have to go through exercise and assignment activity, whereas the bull put spread would simply expire worthless. You can close that one out as well, uh, but uh, if you didn't close out the spread and you let it just expire, it would be out of the money, no exercise and assignment activity, and no commissions there. So it's a little bit uh, intricate uh, but there certainly are some things to consider, execution prices and possibly commissions, if you're analyzing uh, those two similar types of spreads. Okay, that's good to know. Now, how about this? Here's a question that uh, several people had asked. Is there a rule of thumb that we should use when deciding uh, about a spread? Which strikes to choose? Uh, should we do short-term weeklies or long-term monthlies? Is there a rule of thumb that you look for that uh, helps you decide which, uh, which factors to choose when uh, creating a spread? Mm. It's a good question. I get that question often. Um, yeah. It's hard to give a specific answer to that. Your market outlook and forecast generally dictates the specifics of the trade, what strike prices you choose, what expiration dates you choose. Uh, and as I pointed out near the end, your market outlook needs to be followed up with the correct options trade, not the other way around. So uh, when you do your market analysis and you have a target price for the stock, uh, you also would likely know what time frame you expect that to happen in, and you can tweak your options trade to be consistent with that. Now, the only um, general rule of thumb I might point out is that um, you want to sell options at strike prices where you believe the stock will finish. Um, so if you are buying a bull call spread, for example, uh, you're going to try to choose the short strike at a level where you think the stock will expire. Therefore, you get all you can out of that spread and you don't give any upside potential away because the stock expired right at that strike price. So as 
you know, the, the best, most specific answer I can give to the question is uh, short options generally are targeted uh, at a price level where you think the stock will end up at expiration, but uh, the more dominant answer that I would give is that your market analysis and market opinion is going to help you derive the specifics of the trade. Okay, terrific. Looks like we've got time for one last question. Uh, you mentioned legging into spreads. Uh, I know that uh, they can be, uh, it can be highly risky to leg into a spread. Can you cover some of those risks again uh, for our attendees, please? Yeah, there's really two major risks when you leg into a spread, and the first one involves not being able to execute the full spread in its entirety the way you want it to. Uh, the reason why you might leg into a spread in the first place is that you're not comfortable with the price being available in the market, or maybe you have an opinion on the stock, so you want to execute one side and then wait for the stock to move and then execute the other side at a more favorable price. Those are generally why you might leg into a leg into a spread, but what you, what you take the risk of is that you're wrong on that and the stock doesn't move and you get an unexpected uh, change in, in market price and you're either unable to execute the spread at all uh, or you have to execute it at a worse price than you anticipated. The other risk involved short options and keep in mind you have to have approval to trade spreads, you have to have approval to have short options in your account. If you're legging into or out of a spread, leaving yourself with a short, exposed, uncovered option, whether it's a call or put, may be something you're not allowed to do or maybe something that you don't want to do. So keep that in mind, it becomes uh, more predominant when you're near expiration and you're trying to exit a spread where the stock is in between the strike prices and you're trying to get rid of a long option that has value and you're willing to let your short option go and you're not realizing you're going to have to buy back that short option for a few pennies because your account is not authorized to be short an option. So those are the risks and the motivations for legging uh, into and out of spreads. Okay, terrific. Well, Ed, thank you so much uh, for that great information. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time today. Uh, while we weren't able to get to all of your questions, we do have our Investor Services Desk ready to help, and we're standing by to, uh, uh, to take your questions. Feel free to reach out to them at options at theocc.com. That's options with an S at theocc.com. And additionally, as we had said, many of our other webinars are available for viewing on the OIC YouTube channel. Uh, lastly, we did uh, have many questions inquiring about further options education. Please feel free to visit our OIC website at optionseducation.org and see the Getting Started section for further reading and additional options education resources. And of course, please make sure to check that website, optionseducation.org, for our next online or live in-person session. Again, thank you for attending, and we hope to see you next time.